What was Wellington's way of waging war and why was he so successful? Well, today I've asked my good friend and regular contributor to the show, Marcus Cribb, to answer that question. Marcus is a real expert on both the life of the Duke of Wellington and the Peninsula War in general, and I highly recommend you give him a follow on Twitter where he is at mcribhistory. That's at mcribhistory. So, Wellington, Arthur Wellesley, uh, as he was, had quite a complicated uh, system in the peninsula, let's focus on. In India, there's a whole separate segment, and he was there for about nine years. In the Iberian Peninsula, Portugal and Spain, he was nearly always outnumbered and on the back foot. There was at any one time between 200 to 250,000 French in the Iberian Peninsula, and his army fluctuated between 50 to 90,000 men at its kind of zenith. Uh, and many of those were actually then down with sickness and illness, uh, which was the biggest blight really on any strength out there, mostly down to the climate and foreign uh, illnesses that they weren't expecting. Wellington really needed to get into Spain and drive the French out. So firstly, he had to rely upon really good logistics. Uh, and this is something he was very good at, mobilizing uh, the commissary department which were normally very second rate, uh, and he needed to get them to supply his army from Lisbon, from a few of the ports, and as far in as Madrid, and then later into northern Spain. Without the logistics and without the reliance, they would have to live off the land. This couldn't be relied upon in Spain, especially as the population had been so ravaged by the French. Also, to be able to march into Spain, he had to cooperate with the Spanish army, and their councils. This was one of the biggest problems he was always going to have, and this showed him very well as a diplomat. It had gone badly for Sir John Moore uh, in the cooperation, and it had almost gone very badly for Wellington in 1809 at Talavera, when the objectives of the Spanish and the British were slightly different aligned. Uh, this was not so much of a problem with the Portuguese, uh, who were much more trustworthy of the British out there. Uh, the Spanish were not and they had their own objectives and you know remember very recent distrust such as back in 1805 they were fighting against the British at Trafalgar. So he had to work with them so diplomacy so logistics and diplomacy. He also actually had to be on the offensive he needed to get into Spain and drive them out. So yes I always say he was a all-round general not only a defensive general but we actually see that his campaigns are very much normally on the front foot as much as he can do, even where he's actually marched into Spain and then actually fights a kind of defensive battle. The campaigns themselves would normally be on the attack. Also, he's got to work all round the different branches of the armed forces, working with the Royal Navy for supply, but also engineering uh, to build new roads, signal stations, and most famously, the lines of Torres Vedras, which has been covered at other parts, the Red Coat History Channel. Uh, but this is Wellington's uh, defensive lines just north of Lisbon that he could rely upon to fall back to, defend Lisbon, but actually be unbreachable. And Massena was never able to breach uh, those lines, the multiple lines of forts, redoubts and trenches with uh, bomb-proof runways uh, between the two uh, forts. Uh, so the troops can move uh, without the direct shell. And they're very, very well constructed and well supplied. Uh, bringing that all together does really show that Wellington is quite a good all-round general. He was able to fight all the way from down in the southwest, near Lisbon, up through, and multiple times had been pushed back, due, normally due to sheer numbers, uh, through the great sieges and then into the Pyrenees. Uh, his way of waging war really relied upon all of these whilst keeping his ears out, uh, especially using uh, recovery as reconnaissance, working with uh, intelligence officers. He had these exploring officers who nearly always uh, wore their uniforms, F uh, men famous like Colquhoun Grant, uh, who could slip past French patrols 
uh, people like Colonel Waters who had actually been captured. And Wellington was so uh, impressed by Waters, he knew he'd escape very soon. He did it within days and got back. Wellington had moved his supplies with uh, John Waters up because he knew he was going to escape. Really brave, daring men. And these would, uh, men would gather intelligence, work with the locals. And then finally, the actual cooperation, not only with the Spanish military, as I mentioned, uh, but actually with the guerrillas. And this was really important. The Spanish and the Portuguese guerrillas must not be underestimated in the era. Uh, the guerrillas are probably responsible for more French deaths than actually the battles themselves. It was a constant attrition onto the French. Uh, by the end of the war, they had to use at least two squadrons, so over about 200 men, to move a single message without fear of them being ambushed. And then even then in the north of Spain, where the country was very rough, the messages were still being captured. And thanks to Wellington's brilliant intelligence officers, as I mentioned, we'd actually already got the codes that they were using. The codes had been cracked and Wellington was able to read the messages. So using that intelligence, that diplomacy, the engineering and an offensive mindset brings it all together under kind of a banner of logistics. And that was how Wellington waged war in the peninsula. So there you have it. Wellington really was an expert commander, arguably the greatest British general of all time. Thanks again to Marcus for stepping in with that explanation and hopefully he'll be back on the show again soon. As for me, I need to pull my finger out and finally finish the episode on the Battle of Victoria.